All right, so let's get started. First posture, butterfly. So you have two options today. If you want more hips, then heels in close, knees down, coming forward like that. It's gonna be your groin and adductors. More spine, feet out further, and you come forward and down. And you can put a block under your forehead, forearms, you can sit on a block, two blocks under your knees. I will say this, if you're doing this one, then blocks under your knees might actually prevent the stretch. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm not saying it, it will prevent the stretch. You know, somebody might still get a really intense stretch and want a little bit of support here. But the idea behind supporting your legs is that you, you won't stretch. You won't get a lot of sensation. So just keep that in mind that um, it's not a restorative practice. We are trying to stretch and target parts of the body. So even though support here might be really comfy, um, you may not actually be getting the physiological effect if you're trying to stretch here. This one, however, blocks here uh, can really take the edge off of what's going on here because your target is back here. Okay. If there are any questions, let me know, but this is one we do a lot. Shouldn't be any surprises here.
Okay, let's come up. We're going to transition to another posture and then we'll, we'll rest after this next posture. So dragonfly. Same two targets, groin and spine. Um, it's a bit of a different groin stretch. It's more or less the same spine uh, stretch. So just the rounding of the back, okay? And again, this should be fairly straightforward. You can again use support. Some people may want to bend their knees. You can actually support the knees with blocks, um, but you could just bend them and do that as well. The main thing I want to mention, and I mention it almost every time, is we want to be pulled forward by gravity. So if you're there like that, I don't think any of you are, um, but just in case, I can't see you. So gravity is pulling you forward, right?
<clears throat> okay, so let's take a little break. We'll come back onto our back and rest for a few moments. So I definitely feel it in the inside of my thighs, that stretch. I also could feel it in my back as I first came back, but those sensations have dissipated more quickly, the sensitivity in my back. So I'm just sort of feeling the inside of the thighs. And what I feel, interestingly, is my fascia. So over time, you can get more, you can get better and better at kind of feeling the different tissues, what was stretched and worked. So um, the belly of the muscles here, that's where there's a lot of what are called sarcomeres, which is the red uh, part of the muscle. You know, if you think of a hamburger, hamburger meat, that's that, a lot of that red stuff. And the white is going to be either adipose, which is fat, or it's going to be tendinous material, uh, fascia. So I'm feeling it a lot here, which is where the tendon is. And I can kind of just feel, they feel different. The tissues feel different. And over time, you kind of get a feel for, you know, which one you were working. All right, let's bring the legs in, give them a little squeeze. This is one of the reasons why we do the rebound. It's not the only reason by any means, but Learning to feel the, you know, the different parts of your body and the different tissues can be a really, really valuable um, skill to learn, uh, just in general, but especially if you're going to practice yoga. Okay, um, next we have the banana, so we don't need to come up. Just move our hips over to the right, take our leg. Uh, straight into the left, and we just cross one ankle over the other with the legs straight. And then reaching up, grabbing the uh, right wrist, you can pull yourself over. So upper body moves over to the left. And you want to feel a stretch in the right waist and ribs.
let's switch sides. So we'll move our hips over to the left edge of the mat. As you do, just maybe take a moment to feel both sides. I definitely can feel uh, this side right now feels kind of like a gentle burning or tingling sensation on it as I come out of that. So it's probably a sensation of like blood moving back into the tissues. I don't think it's that important to try and analyze or understand what's happening. We can just feel that something is happening or something has happened, right? So we just, we may not, you know, uh, understand exactly what's going on. And I don't think it's important. Um, you know, our idea, our kind of Western ideas of, oh, that's blood flow or that's uh, lymph or that's whatever. Um, you know, yes and no. I, I think it just, again, the ancient um, peoples that developed these practices, they probably would have described that as chi or prana energy. Um, now blood, is a type of chi according to the Taoists. So it's it's not like there is a clear dividing line. Um, the only reason I mention it is just we as human beings, we like stories, we like concepts, we like to believe we understand, we like to believe we know. It gives us a sense of safety and security um, it makes us feel like we're in control. And again, just sort of believing I understand something very often just gives me a sense of, again, because we, we have survived and dominated because of our big brains, right? And, and our ability to think abstractly. And, you know, we kind of dominate through that. So a porcupine has its quills, you know, uh, a tiger or a lion has its claws and its teeth. A human, we don't have quills, we don't have big teeth, we're not that strong, we have our brains. Um, but what you find with human beings, unlike the tiger or the lion or the porcupine, um, is that the big brain thing is a two-edged sword. And so it's absolutely useful and helpful to create concepts, to try and understand, to try and predict, uh, you know, again, a, lo a lot of what we call science and medicine and, and even, you know, yoga and, and Taoist theory these things are, you know, trying to predict causes and effects. So if you look at Ayurvedic medicine, uh, Taoist medicine, what we call, um, you know, Chinese medicine, in its various forms, classical, traditional, um, these are theories and theories try and predict cause and effect. You know, so you're having this effect, this symptom, what is the cause? And then by changing the cause, you change the effect. And so there's nothing harmful or wrong with that in general. Again, useful for us, helpful for us as human beings. It's how we've survived. It's how we've thrived. But the mind can also become our worst enemy as well as our greatest ally. And so a lot of us have thoughts and judgments about ourselves that are very hurtful. Uh, maybe about our bodies, we might have a, you know, wish our body looked different than it does. Um, it may be about us as a person. Now, for most human beings, only a fraction of these are actually conscious part of our conscious awareness. Um, usually these thoughts show up as emotions. So again, um, maybe if someone expresses displeasure with something that I've done, I might feel 
you know, a, a certain emotion in response to that. And that emotion might be guilt or shame, you know, feeling like unworthiness is another one that might come up. Um, at an extreme, that could lead to something like, you know, depression or anxiety, stress, right? If I, I feel like I'm not good enough, then I might worry about my employment status or my status with my partner, right? I might be worried that they're going to leave me or something like that. So this is the flip side of having these big brains and uh, you know, this sort of predictive capacity is oftentimes we have these thoughts that cause a lot of suffering. Um, they're not really helping us do anything. Again, if I feel like I'm not good enough and that inspires me or drives me to improve and it, the feeling goes away, then that's fine. Right, because sometimes we may not be doing a good job. So it might have saying, "God, I'm not doing a very good job. I need to improve." And then I take action, and then the feeling goes away. That's awesome. Um, but for a lot of people, these thoughts are buried so deep down, and they're not really aware of them, and they just kind of keep recycling and coming up. Um, and this can really affect our lives in a big way. All right, let's come on out of that. We'll rest for a moment. When I say it affects our lives in a big way, it affects us in a few ways. It affects our ability to feel connected with others, our ability to feel compassion for ourselves, for others, to feel and receive and give love freely. Very often we're trying to protect ourselves. It affects our relationships very directly, who we relate with, how we relate with them. Um, it can affect things like what we are able to achieve with our life, um, whether or not we're able to achieve certain goals. It also just affects our overall sense of well-being and happiness. So we may not realize that we could be more happy than we are. <laughs> we might think that whatever the pleasures we have in our life, that's sort of the maximum happiness that's available to us. Um, but when you dive deep into spirituality and you do certain things, you can access sometimes just levels of happiness that you didn't even know were possible. And it's a very eye-opening experience when you have that. All right, let's bring our legs in. We'll give them a little squeeze. Shake it off, a little bit of movement. And then we'll go ahead and hinge up. And we'll transition to a tabletop, do a little bit of warm up and stretch out here for the second half. I like to sequence back bends usually toward the second half of a class. You know, we've already stretched out a bit. You could say warmed up. It's kind of a weird word to use for yin yoga. You're not really warming up, but you know, you're stretched out a bit. Let's do a little down dog as well. Okay. So first back bend is the Sphinx, which is, uh, I think everyone's familiar with it. Sphinx or seal. Come down onto our belly and prop ourselves up on the elbows. Just like that. Okay, and then if you need a little bit more, I do. I'm not really feeling the back today, so I'm going to straighten my arms. Variations are the same. So head held up, drop forward, drop back, 
shoulders depressed or relaxed, legs together or apart, okay? So thoughts, these thoughts, wh whether thoughts are conscious or not, um, thoughts can cause us suffering. So unconscious thoughts, again, are according to uh, my one of my teachers, are the drivers of something like addiction, addictive behavior. I know it's been very popular, so I think all of you and me as well have grown up with this idea that um, you know, brain chemistry is all important when it comes to depression, when it comes to um, things like addiction and things like that. But this isn't what we're seeing. Um, again, my teacher actually runs addiction centers. So he has a, a lot of experience with this, direct experience. This isn't just conjecture. This isn't just um, you know, a spiritual realization of one individual without any um, data or scientific evidence or clinical evidence to back it up. So what he finds when he works with people is that the drivers of addiction, and again, I'm not saying biochemistry, brain chemistry, genetics plays no role, okay? So um, again, not saying that that's, that's not a contributing factor. And I'm also not saying that it is, if you're an addict or something like that, that that's your fault. So I want to be really clear about that. Not assigning blame or fault uh, anywhere. But the drivers of addiction, what uh, he finds is um, what's called a deficiency story. Now, the way that my teachers uh, define addiction is maybe broader than most people. So a lot of people think uh, an alcoholic is an addict, uh, a drug addict is an addict, um, sexual compulsion is an addict, but uh, things like compulsively eating certain foods that you would rather not eat is not addiction. Well, I mean, really, what's the difference? If I'm like, I don't want to eat chocolate cake because <laughs> I want to lose weight or I don't think it's good for me, um, you know, I'm trying to be healthy, whatever, whatever your reason for choosing not to eat something, um, you say to yourself, you know, say in the morning when you wake up, I'm not going to do or eat this thing or that thing or whatever it is. And then you find yourself later in the day doing just that. Why? How is that any different than the person who says, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to have a drink today. And then ends up at the bar that night, you know, drinking way too much. Now I'll say this, there's a difference in that alcohol and drugs tend to be more harmful. So the way my teacher discusses these things is he calls them external resources. And it's a very compassionate way of talking about addiction, that an addict reaches for a substance, whether it's, again, you know, something that will change her experience, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, food, uh, a, you know, checking out with television, they seek these things out because they can't or they don't think they can handle what they're feeling, uh, the emotions they're feeling, the self-hatred, the self-loathing, whatever it is. So they sort of drown it out with something that creates a stronger physiological response. Now, as strange as it sounds, some people will actually use exercise and even yoga in the same way. They sort of use yoga to numb out, um, to not feel. They'll use meditation, yoga, spirituality to try and avoid feeling um, because, again, what they feel inside is so scary to them and so overwhelming. So it's just good to note that. So again, when I'm talking about addiction, we can actually have people who are essentially 
like spiritual addicts or yoga addicts, you might say. So again, addiction is separate from the substance uh, that somebody is abusing. All right, let's come on out of that. Now I'm going to give you three choices next. The first is just to repeat Sphinx or Seal. That's super accessible. Almost any time I teach that, there are very few people who just can't do that in some form. You know, even if you're like way down here because you have a back injury, right? Most people can do some form of that posture. Um, I'm not going to demo it today, but second choice is a bridge pose, supported bridge. So you would come onto your back, lift your hips up, put a block under your hips to support you. And then you can extend your arms up and extend your legs out onto the mat. And you're looking for two things, a little bit of compression in your back and a stretch along the front side. Final choice, and the one I'm going to do today, is going to be the saddle pose. So full saddle is uh, we fold the feet back alongside the hips. The toes can point back or out to the side. Knees can be together or apart, and we can sit on a block or even a stack of blocks. And then if you're feeling a stretch here, just stay where you are. Just let that stretch happen. Um, but if you don't feel stretch, you can come to your hands, elbows, onto a bolster, or even all the way back onto your back. Okay, so feeling that stretch along the front side of the body. So I really like the way that he talks about that because it, what I found in my work in, you know, exploring spirituality, um, I really like the teachings of uh, Jesus, but maybe not in the way, I maybe don't emphasize the same things that certain pastors or preachers or churches might emphasize. Um, for me, what I get from what I'm aware of of Jesus' teaching, I'm by no means an expert. So again, I just have sort of a casual relationship um, with his teaching. But what I get when I you know, hear his, his teaching, what I get from it is an emphasis on forgiveness non-judgment, um, yeah, those two principles. And so what my teacher um, is doing with recovery in his centers is he's trying to, again, shift things away from perception that a person who uses alcohol or drugs or any other substance or form um, of addiction is a bad person, that they have a bad moral character. Um, I think in many recovery programs, again, I'm not an expert, but actually many of my teachers, uh, several of them, not all of them, and I've, I've never had a, like, a compulsive relationship, really. Nothing serious like that. So uh, I'm not an addict. It's not like my teachers are addicts because I was an addict. Just a few really, really awake, spiritual um, people I've met have come out of recovery or having an addiction and it's given them a lot of insight. It's made them very, very insightful spiritual people. That experience really did a lot for them. Um, but anyway, the, the thing that they're doing with these recovery centers is, again, they're sort of taking um, the blame off of the, the person who I think some of what people were trying to do with the idea of it being a chemical imbalance or it being genetic or something like that, and again, I'm not saying genetics don't play a role. Everything plays a role in everything. <laughs> it all 
contributes, but not everyone with you know a certain heritage ends up as an addict. It just doesn't work that way, right? So there's other factors going on. Um, so again, what drives someone, you know, to to abuse something where they clearly are hurting themselves or hurting others? What could be something that would cause them to do that? It's a, a deficiency story. And so when we understand those things, we again shift the the blame off of the individual. And we're not putting it someplace else necessarily. It's just this sort of story that this person has picked up at some point. And to be really frank with you, most people have that. Again, some people it's very, very painful. It's very deep rooted. There's a lot of energy with it. Um, and those are very often the people, maybe again, along with certain propensities um, you know, that are there from the genetics, those are the people that might end up you know, with a real problem. But the word that I use for it, this isn't a word that they use in the addiction center, is just self-soothing. And that's something that most of us do in one form or another. If we feel poorly or badly, we might pull up our favorite television show we might eat our favorite food. Um, we might do something that we suspect will make us feel better. And that's just sort of a natural human thing that we all do. Um, all right, let's go ahead and come on out of this. Let's rest for a moment. All right, let's pull those legs in, give them a little squeeze. Got money coming out of my pocket. Rich. All right. So let's finish with a twist. Twisted roots, right knee over the left, and the knees go down to the left side. Okay. Play around with the arm and leg position to optimize your twist. So beyond addiction, these unconscious thoughts often drive, again, our relationships and our behavior. For instance, maybe your partner, your parents, or your children say certain things that really upset you and, and make you mad. And maybe if those same things are said to your sibling your um, partner, um, you know, somebody else, your friend, they don't get upset at all. So again, it's very interesting, like why, if getting upset were really in the words, then everyone would get equally upset when the same thing was said, but that's just not what we find, right? So we can say, one thing to one person and they get very upset. You say the same thing to someone else and they don't care. Um, so again, these things, the things that upset us are very often just a reflection of what we unconsciously believe is true about us. So again, if I think, for instance, if I have a deficiency story that like, I'm an unsensitive bastard, right? <laughs> Just as an example, some, you know, at some point that idea got lodged in my unconscious. Again, this is hardly ever people are aware of it. 
it usually takes quite a bit of work to become aware of these things. But let's say on some level, you know, I believe that unconsciously about myself. Uh, maybe my first girlfriend said that to me when I was really young and I, it just sort of stuck in there. Um, and I believe it on some level, right? And then somebody says to me, you know, I'm doing something or I'm telling them about something I did. And they say, well, it seems kind of unsensitive. And they say it not in an accusatory, attacking way or to make me feel bad. They're just making a factual statement. But then I get upset, right? Maybe I get upset and I yell at them, or maybe I don't even yell. I just feel really bad. And it kind of like sticks with me for a few days. I feel just bad and, you know, guilty or whatever. Um, that's because of that unconscious thought there that I believe that on some level. And very often that's the way it works. So it can be interesting for us to just introspect and notice like what sorts of comments or judgments that people make, which ones stick. And I'll give you an, an opposite example because that can be helpful for understanding too. So for instance, let's say I saw you um, and I don't, I can't see you guys, so I don't know what's going on, but let's just say, let's hope, or I don't care really, but um, let's just say you all have your natural hair color. Okay, so your hair is blonde or black or, you know, white or whatever color it is. You haven't been dyeing your hair or coloring it. And imagine that someone comes up to you and they say, oh, I really don't like your purple hair. Um, you're not going to get upset. You're going to be confused. And you might even laugh. You're like, well, what purple hair are you talking about? I don't have purple hair. Right? That's how we respond to something when we don't believe it's true. Right? Even if it's an insult. Even if someone like, I really hate your purple hair. Just want you to know that. Again, you're, you're not going to get upset. You're just going to be confused. Like, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, this is a very strange thing. So it's usually the things that we believe on some unconscious level about ourselves um, that are the things that upset us. So it's interesting to just notice, like, what kinds of things can our partners or loved ones, parents, children, what can they say that will not upset us? And what do they say that really kind of digs deep and hurts? All right, let's switch sides. Mm. So this is what I was saying earlier about, you know, thoughts being the kind of two-edged edged sword that they are extremely powerful and useful when we know how to use them, when we use them properly in the right way. Um, but also for us human beings, generally the source of our suffering. So generally, you can traumatize animals, but usually traumatizing an animal involves um, physical abuse and repeated physical abuse. And then you can create some really deranged behavior in an animal. Um, that can happen. Okay, they've done it in lab studies and things. But with people, it's different. Where, of course, you can traumatize a person physically. It happens. You know, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Um, even an accident or something like that, right, can create a tra traumatic response in the body. Um, but what you find is human beings get sort of, uh, traumatized is probably not the right word, but in a sense it is. It's sort of like a little trauma, a little thing. We 
we can be traumatized by words and things that are said to us. And oftentimes things that are said to us by the people who maybe love us the most and care about us the most, but they're people and you know, they get upset and they get hurt and they have their own triggers and responses with things. Um, and so that's where we can end up with these thoughts, conscious or unconscious, that are very hurtful. And very often when we're hurt and in pain and suffering, unless we're pretty aware or conscious, very often um, we end up throwing that on others. We might blame others, actually. So again, if I have a sensitivity about a certain thing, and my partner's trying to bring that up with me, but I'm super sensitive on that subject, then I may get upset and unfairly treat my partner unfairly. Um, and they didn't really do anything wrong. They were just trying to bring up a subject or discuss something. Um, so that creates, you know, suffering. It creates pain. Um, and then a lot of times the most pain is just created for ourselves, where we just are believing something that ultimately isn't true. I do um, work with people, it's called inquiry, where we pull up these unconscious thoughts. And one of the very, very common things that people have is a deep sense of unworthiness, where they don't feel like they're worthy of love. They feel like they don't deserve good things. Um, and this manifests in their lives. And unfortunately, it those unconscious thoughts tend to find a way of proving themselves right, <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it. So we will either imagine, you know, that we are, if I feel unlovable, if that's my deficiency story, then even when people love me, I won't feel it. Um, and my mind will fixate on examples where it sees that I'm, I'm not being loved. Um, so I'll, I'll just, you know, be like, oh, this person left me and that person left me and my parents didn't come to my recital. And, you know, it'll just cherry pick. It won't look at the examples where we're actually receiving love. It'll just sort of cherry pick these examples and really put them in your face. And again, you'll feel a really strong response when those things happen. And, you know, when you're getting the love that uh, you seek and want, you know, you, you'll just sort of take it for granted. All right, let's unwind from there. So one of the great gifts that teachers like Buddha or uh, Jesus, and my, again, the way that I sort of see Jesus is one of the great gifts that they gave us is they were pointing to this double-edged um, nature of the human mind. And um, what they did is they tried to teach us and give us tools that we could use so that we could train the mind so that it was only helping us and not hurting us. Um, because I'd say, this is just my opinion, but the vast majority of humans don't actually know how to manage their thoughts and their mind. They don't even know that they can train the mind. And so it's a little bit like having a part of your body that doesn't respond, you know, like your arm just kind of does whatever it wants to do. It's not under your control. 
That's how most of us treat our thoughts and our mind. We just act like there's nothing I can do about it. It just does what it does. And we take everything that shows up in our mind as reality, as truth. We don't question it. Um, and again, a lot of those hurtful thoughts, we need to question those because they're not true. All right, let's bring our legs in, we'll give them a little squeeze, shake it out. And as usual, I'll encourage you, I, I can't uh, force you to, but I'll encourage you to take the next few minutes to relax in stillness. You can set a timer for six minutes and just allow your body to be still for that time. <laughs> 